Uh, hi, I'm Tom Averbuchen. I'm a graduate student in Marius Wernig's lab at the Stanford Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. And uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, reprogramming approaches to study human neurons. A critical uh, problem in the study of human neurological disorders is that we, um, although we understand that these uh, disorders are caused by mutations, in some cases are caused by mutations in specific genes, um, we don't have an, any access to neurons actually from these disorders, patients suffering from these disorders. Because really there's no way to um, generate a culture of human neurons from an adult patient. And uh, really in order to, to study the disease and to be able to understand the disease, you would need both cells that contain the mutations that cause the disorder, as well as the cells that are affected in that disease, uh, which for these disorders is uh, different types of neurons. So we um, really, at this point, it's difficult to generate um, neurons that have a mutation that, say, causes autism, is known to cause autism. We can't get neurons from a patient that has that disorder in order to study the functional properties of those neurons. So uh, one, one critical breakthrough that uh, allowed uh, researchers to generate uh, actual human neurons uh, was the discovery uh, that embryonic stem cells could be uh, cultured from early human embryos. And so what this allowed uh, researchers to do is to generate these uh, cultures of human embryonic stem cells, which are capable of forming all the cells uh, in the adult body. And so then what we can do is take embryonic stem cells co and coax them into forming different types of neurons uh, in, in a culture dish. But unfortunately, these uh, are not patient-specific cells. So we, the embryonic stem cell lines that are available uh, are not uh, from patients suffering from a disorder. So they don't have the right uh, gene mutations that would be uh, causing these neurological disorders. And so in order to study these diseases, we really need the right cells, which we can get from embryonic stem cells to a certain extent, but then those cells have to have the right genetic mutations as well, which is only possible if the cells come from the patients suffering from these disorders. So a, a critical sort of a way around this problem was um, a, dis a key discovery made by Shinya Yamanaka in 2006 uh, concerning what's called cellular reprogramming. So cellular reprogramming is a way of converting one type of cell into another by mimicking uh, developmental pathways. And, and when I say that, I mean usually by uh, expressing transcription factors that are important for making a cell in the embryo, we can express those transcription factors in another cell type and then force that cell type to turn into a cell type that we're interested in. And so what um, Dr. Yamanaka showed that uh, you can take skin fibroblasts from a mouse and also from a human and uh, introduce these four transcription factors uh, to those cells. And then you can actually reprogram the skin fibroblasts and have them behave like pluripotent stem cells or like embryonic stem cells. And these are called induced pluripotent stem cells. Uh, so then what this would allow you to do is to take a skin biopsy from a patient, which is very straightforward, uh, culture those cells, then reprogram them to an embryonic stem cell-like state. And then you have basically embryonic stem cells that are patient-specific. And so you can generate, you can coax those cells to differentiate into neurons, for example, and you would have um, neurons that ex have the specific genetic mutation you're interested in if you start from a patient who you know has that mutation. Um, and so uh, in order to do that, uh, you have to start with a, a skin biopsy from a patient uh, suffering from um, any disorder that you're interested in. Uh, take that skin biopsy, culture those cells, um, introduce these four transcription factors, uh, and then this process of reprogramming these cells uh, to the pluripotent state where they act like embryonic stem cells takes between four and 10 weeks to do a very good job of it. And it's, it's a little bit, uh, labor intensive, uh, it's expensive, and it's not uh, so completely straightforward. Um, and so then once you have these induced pluripotent stem cells, to turn them into neurons and to sort of coax them into forming the cells that you want, take, can take up to uh, as much as three months, uh, again, to, to go from the, the embryonic stem cell state to patient-specific neurons. And this is also not so straightforward. It's very difficult to generate a pure population of cells of interest to study uh, from that patient but you can get um, a variety of different types of neurons. So it's a very powerful approach starting from the pluripotent state. You can generate 
many different types of neurons, but actually generating them is not completely straightforward. And that's people are uh, intensely working on how to generate very pure populations of specific types of neurons. Um, so one thing that we um, thought is, well, it, you know, really what you want is the patient-specific neurons. And so the induced pluripotent stem cells are helpful because you can generate, in theory, any type of tissue. But if you know that you want to study, for example, a neurological disorder, then you really just want neurons. And so what we wonder is, can we go straight from these patient fibroblasts right to the patient-specific neurons and sort of cutting out this middle step of uh, the pluripotent uh, reprogramming? And this, uh, in theory, could uh, allow it to be much more cost-effective and efficient of a process if you needed to generate cells from a particular patient. Uh, so in order to do this, uh, we hypothesized that uh, similar to an approach that was taken to uh, determine how to reprogram fibroblasts to a pluripotent state, as I mentioned before, we basically took candidate transcription factors, uh, 19 candidate transcription factors that are involved in making neurons during development. And we, we reasoned that these would be uh, they would contain the information required to uh, recapitulate neuronal differentiation outside of its normal context. So by uh, introducing these cells into skin fibroblasts, um, we, we took all of them together, not knowing which ones would be effective, introduced them all into skin fibroblasts, and we found actually that when we did this, what we got were what we called induced neurons, or these were cells that came from the fibroblast culture and uh, looked and to us like neurons. And so um, this, was a promising initial step, but we really needed to characterize these cells further. And uh, so once, uh, you know, they, the cells look like neurons, and then so we said, do they also express other uh, neuronal specific genes? And so what we found is that um, they do, in fact, uh, express a variety of pan-neuronal specific proteins and even more mature markers such as synapsin and uh, vglut1. Uh, and so these cells I'm talking about we finally found uh, three specific genes uh, called BRAIN2, ASCL1, and MYT1L that are sufficient to reprogram fibroblasts into the neuronal state. Um, and so these cells uh, seem to look like neurons. They express the right proteins. But a key uh, aspect of whether they're really neurons is whether they have the functional properties of neurons. Um, and so, um, so in order to do that, we um, collaborated with uh, Tom Sudoff's lab to um, study the functional properties of these induced neuronal cells. And what we found is that um, they have, they're able to form trains of action potentials, these electrical spikes, um, and sort of speak the language of neurons, if you will. Um, and not only that, is that uh, they can also form synaptic connections, which are really the basis of um, neuronal uh, communication throughout the brain. And that um, these are actually individual events where one induced neuron is talking to another one through a synaptic connection. And this is really an unambiguous demonstration that these cells have a functional property that is unique to neurons. And so we've, we were uh, convinced then at this point that these cells behave like neurons functionally and express all the right neuronal proteins. So we thought that we could uh, potentially use these cells then to look at um, neurological disorders and, and possibly um, model these, those diseases in culture. So uh, all those studies were, were done with mouse cells. And so uh, an obvious question was, can we do the same thing with human cells, which would be really important for actually doing this with human cells. We started with mouse because of the experimental tools that were available. It's much uh, more straightforward to, uh, to, to do that as a starting point. So then after showing that we can do it in mouse, we moved on to human cells. And we found that initially it was not working as well uh, as it did with the mouse cells, with the analogous three transcription factors. And so uh, we screened for additional candidates that might improve this process and allow us to generate, more efficiently generate, um, human neurons directly from fibroblasts. And what we found is that uh, a gene called NeuroD1 here was actually to, uh, was able to increase the efficiency two to three-fold in terms of how many neurons we can generate from fibroblasts. And um, so then, as you can see here, the combination of these four genes allowed us to generate neuronal cells um, from human fibroblasts as well, from uh, embryonic human fibroblasts and also from uh, perinatal um, human tissue. So um, this was, uh, it was really important to see that we could do this with human cells and not just with mouse cells. And so then, really, we, this is the, the first steps towards being able to use this um, to model human neurodegenerative or uh, neurological disorders uh, in a dish without involving a pluripotent state. 
so we did a, a similar test to determine whether uh, these human cells also function similar to the mouse cells. Um, and what we did was we took uh, the human-induced neur neuronal cells and, and mixed them together with uh, mouse neurons from a mouse brain, real mouse neurons uh, from the mouse cortex. Um, and when we did that, we were able to see that the mouse neurons communicated um, through synapses with uh, the human-induced neurons, uh, which suggested that they had acquired functional properties, again, consistent with um, a, a mature, a somewhat mature neuron. Uh, but there's really still um, a long way to go in terms of uh, getting these cells to the point where they're um, behaving like a mature neuron would in a human brain. Um, and that's sort of an ongoing area of investigation is to mature these cells um, uh, it, along with everyone in the field, really, to uh, f whether they come from embryonic cells or from fibroblasts, is to get these cells to a very mature state where they're um, more analogous to what you would find in a brain. Uh, and so what we think um, we have with this, with this method is that um, we initially generated really only one type of neuron, which would be an excitatory or glutamatergic neuron. Um, but there's many neurons in the, in the human brain. And so our group, as well as other groups, um, have sort of expanded upon this technique. And we think it's, it's some, in some ways a, a customizable method for generating multiple different types of neurons. Um, and so neurons have been generated with uh, characteristics of uh, dopaminergic neurons, uh, which are the neurons that uh, degenerate in Parkinson's disease, as well as um, inhibitory uh, neurons or, or motor neurons even. And so we think uh, with more progress and more work, uh, our group and, and many other groups as well um, should be able to expand upon this technique to make it more generalizable to a, a variety of neuronal types, which would expand its utility in terms of being able to potentially model other neurological disorders. But uh, again, these are very early. This is very early work, and there's still a long way to go to get these cells to the point where they need to be. But uh, we think it's sort of a promising start uh, and, a, and has a good, a good promise as a method and as an alternative to um, induced pluripotent stem cell-based approaches. So um, once we generate these cells, uh, how would we use them really to study a neurolog neurological disorder? And so I think really what, what people in the field talk about and what we think is that the key is that you, you're able to generate these cells not only from a patients affected with uh, a neurological disorder that's caused by a genetic mutation, but also uh, to, to generate cells from their relatives, their close relatives, as a, a sort of a genetic control um, for the diseased neurons versus the regular neurons. And then once you've generated these cells, you can compare their properties in culture, their functional properties, uh, whether they behave the same way or whether you see um, stereotypical defects in the patient cells versus the uh, genetically controlled uh, family members who are unaffected whether you can see consistent deficits in the function of these cells compared to the uh, unaffected controls. If you're able to figure out how to generate these cells um, and, and you could define disease-specific traits in these cells, then that would allow you to generate a large number of these cells and culture and actually screen compounds that might uh, reverse that, um, dis, dis, that defect in the cells. And that would allow you to um, perform what some people have called an in vitro clinical trial in some ways to look for efficacy without worrying about uh, hurting patients by actually having to test the compounds on them beforehand. And so this could, um, could be a very nice way to, uh, to discover compounds that might have some therapeutic utility, at least in a culture dish. And so um, this is really, again, in early days, and people are um, many people in the field um, are trying to screen disease versus control patients cells derived from uh, induced pluripotent stem cells and then differentiated into neurons. And so uh, we and others are, are trying to see if we can see defects in these um, induced neurons from human patients and also in, in mouse. If we see, have a mouse with a genetic disorder, can we see that defect in the mouse-induced neurons versus the mouse uh, actual neurons from the mouse brain? Um, and so I just wanted to, um, so this is all work done uh, in, in Marius Werning's lab uh, in collaboration with many um, members of the Werning lab, uh, specific, especially Nan Yang and uh, Austin Ostermeyer, uh, and our, our really important collaborators for this work uh, is Ji Ping Pang and uh, Dr. Tom Sudoff, who's also um, in the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. And uh, thank you. <laughs>